Welcome to another episode of Knox Narratives. We're talking about women's history, and I'm with Wanda Sobieski, who is the president of the Suffrage Coalition. Wanda, tell us about yourself. I used to be a lawyer. I still am trying to get over being a lawyer. <laughs> I've had a long-term interest in the history of women's suffrage. In high school, the whole suffrage movement was covered with one sentence in our history books that said in 1920, Congress gave women the right to vote. And it was not given, it was taken by the women. <laughs> a 72 year battle. It was hostile, it was draining, it was exhausting, and they were incredibly persistent. Tell us about Tennessee's role in the ratification of the 19th Amendment. It took 36 states to ratify an amendment before it would become law. So Congress would pass the amendment, then it would go to the states. By 1919, it finally passed Congress, and then it went to the states. And by the spring of 1920, 35 states had ratified, and then it stalled. So it was looking really bad. Some governors refused to even bring it up. Others just outright, it failed. And it really came down to a couple of states. Well, Tennessee, in the summer of 1920, it passes the Senate easy, goes to the House, and it looks like it's gonna be a loss. The way they could tell is when the gentlemen, they were all men, would wear a red rose if they were anti-suffrage, and they would be wearing a yellow rose if they were pro-suffrage. And so they could sit in the balcony and count the roses and tell how the outcome was going to be. There are a couple attempts to table it, not vote on it, uh, both of which failed because it was a dead tie. So the vote was called on the resolution. The expectation was that it was going to fail. The accounts from the Times said there was audible sobbing in the legislature at that point. And then they got to the youngest legislator, 24-year-old Harry Byrne from right down the street here in Nyota, wearing a red rose, stood up and voted for suffrage, broke the tie. Of course, a riot broke out in the, in the legislature. The National Guard was called in. Harry had hid for two or three hours till it was safe for him to come out. And there were lots of efforts to try to stop it and take it back. But those efforts failed and Tennessee became the perfect 36 that gave the final approval necessary for us to get the right to vote. Why did Harry change his vote? Harry changed the vote because he received that morning a letter from his mother, very well read, very quiet kind of person, never marched in a parade as far as we can tell or anything like that, but she wanted him to be a good boy and vote for suffrage. And he knew it was the right thing to do, so he did it even though he thought his people in McMinn County wanted him to vote against it. But then again, the women of McMinn County re-elected him. He was up for election in November. He, he had a much larger constituency because of that vote. <laughs> so let's fast forward 75 years and you are appointed to... Suffrage Commission, suffrage statewide commission. suffrage commission. I started looking more specifically at Tennessee's role and was shocked when I discovered in 1995 that Tennessee didn't have anywhere in the state even a plaque <laughs> recognizing the work, incredible work of the women of Tennessee who made Tennessee the perfect 36, the final state necessary to give us the right to vote. I started working with some other folks to see if we couldn't fix that. And I'm proud to say what we have. We designed and raised the money for and then erected the Tennessee Woman Suffrage Memorial on Market Square that has three women, one from each of the grand divisions, that worked in Tennessee for the vote. We were focusing on people who were here doing it in spite of the culture that was pretty hostile to them. There's Ann Dallas Dudley from Nashville. Uh, she's the one with the arm out to the side. In the middle leading the parade is Lizzie Crozier French from Knoxville, and then Elizabeth Avery Merriweather from West Tennessee, Memphis, is on the other side. She called the first public suffrage meeting in 1872. We also designed, raised the funds for and erected the Byrne Memorial, which is just a block away from the Tennessee Woman Suffrage Memorial on the corner of Clinch and Market. And uh, that honors Harry Byrne, the young legislator, and his mother who wrote the letter, 
and he's seated in his legislative chair and she's there with her hand on his shoulder nudging him in the right direction. <laughs> so, and it tells the story and it's appropriate because the McClung collection right next to it houses the actual letter. I've read several times that people say, oh, there was never any such letter. Well, we have it right here. The, the letter is real. And so we raised the funds for the McClung collection to be able to digitize Lizzie Crozier French's papers that were left there and Harry Burns' papers related to suffrage. So those are now available free on the web. Because when we started this, it was very hard to find primary materials. And historians, if you have to summarize somebody else's work, it gets a little bit skewed with your own perspective. And so I really wanted to work from originals, the words of the suffragists themselves, and the anti-suffragists as well. And so we started collecting wherever we could find newspapers, pamphlets, materials that were original. And as it turns out, we have quite a lot collected now. <laughs> and so uh, we're hoping that we may be able to put them in a permanent location where they'll be permanently available to the public here in Knoxville and learn more about amazing people. I mean, we didn't know until just recently that in Morristown in 1913, there was a convention held and Dallas Dudley, the one from Nashville, spoke there and somebody went up on the roof and poured sulfuric acid through the skylight on the stage and just missed Ann Dallas Dudley, who never missed a beat, just kept speaking, <laughs> just did her thing. There was a lot of opposition and they were brave to be doing that. That's one of the things that's lost, especially to the people that are going through those events. You don't know what the outcome is going to be. And just having the bravery and the courage and the determination to keep on through all that uh, says something about them. Well, when the women that started the suffrage movement began it, they usually think it's 1848, the Seneca Falls Convention, women had no rights even to their own children. Their husbands could give them away. Married women couldn't own property. They didn't even own the clothes on their back. Their husband owned them. Their ability to function was just so limited to accomplish what they did against the odds without money because the money interests were the ones who were funding the opposition, the liquor interests, the manufacturers, because they were afraid if women got the right to vote, they'd do away with child labor. And they did. <laughs> they were right about that. So, I mean, it's pretty amazing what they did. And what's more amazing to me is we have encountered a number of descendants of suffragists that we've tracked down who had no idea their grandmother was involved, let alone played a really important role. One young great-great-niece uh, contacted me about Lizzie Crozier French. She saw the memorial on Market Square on the internet and came to Knoxville and went to the History Center and asked who she could talk to to find out about her great aunt. So she came over and sat right here in this room and I told her about <laughs> her relative. That's amazing. <laughs> It was an amazing experience. So what did you tell her? What was her, her great aunt like? Well, it's not just that she was a suffragist. She was an amazing person, very involved in the community. She worked on smoke ordinances so that we'd have healthier air in downtown Knoxville. She worked on movie ratings so kids could go to movies and we know, I mean, there were all kinds of things that she worked on, but she was most proud of suffrage. But what she did, if you read her speeches, she did it in such a disarming way that even the people who were violently opposed to her beliefs were charmed by her. She did a really good job of representing the suffrage movement. And she started our first suffrage club here in East Tennessee. There will be a new marker at her grave. She's in Old Grace Cemetery a new marker to go by her grave that will tell more about her and have a QR code so that you can find out all kinds of additional stuff about Lizzie Crozier French, which is a wonderful thing. And I've got a long story I could tell you about an armed conflict at the courthouse that led to Tennessee. I that would be great, <laughs> actually, please. Well, in 1917, by then there were the National Women's Party protesting at the White House to remind President Wilson that women in his country couldn't vote because he was going all over the world extolling the virtues of democracy. And so they would take his words and put them on banners and, and point out the hypocrisy. Louis Brownlow, he was District of Columbia Commissioner of Police and he 
ordered, started ordering the arrests of the women. And they were arrested and put into a, a condemned prison that was uninhabitable for men. Terrible, terrible conditions. And so they decided, the National Women's Party decided, they would send out what they called the Dixie Tour through the South. And these women who had been arrested and spent time in jail and in the conditions would go through the South telling people what happened. But when they got to Memphis, the lawyers and the judges had gone to the property owners and got them to break their contracts with the women. So they had no place to speak and no place to stay. And then they went to the city councils and got them to pass resolutions forbidding them to speak in public. So they were just shut down in, in Memphis. That whole First Amendment <laughs> thing went out the window too. <laughs> right, right, right out the window. Then they had reserved Market Hall here on Market Square. The judges and the lawyers did basically the same thing. And the mayor then, Mayor McMillan, introduced a resolution to bar them from speaking in public. Well, Lizzie Crozier French, who's the lead woman on our statue in Market Square, her grandfather donated the land the courthouse sits on. So she felt she had some interest in it. <laughs> and she went down to the courthouse and met with Judge Trotter and convinced him to let her use his courtroom. He said yes, but that it had to be approved by the courthouse committee of judges and lawyers. <laughs> and so <laughs> the committee made them both, that was Joy Young and Maud Younger, give their entire speeches, said there was nothing seditious or improper about their speeches, they should speak. So they thought they had it made and they were so excited. They got there and the sheriff came out with 10 armed deputies and refused to let them enter the courthouse. He wasn't gonna let it happen. So the labor hall heard about it. They sent, according to one account, 80 armed men down who then chased the sheriff inside the courthouse and barred him in there with his deputies. Then they formed a ring around the courthouse and Maud Younger walked up that front steps up to that little platform and she said that the sheriff had the courthouse but she had the audience and she gave her speech there. <laughs> in my heart I believe that Southern women are due some special credit for working in suffrage because in the South the culture really was more difficult culture for women to stand up and speak out especially in the 1800s, early 1900s. So those are some pretty feisty women in the South. <laughs> You all are looking at Knoxville for a suffrage museum then? I think it ne needs to be in East Tennessee and Knoxville has long been considered the capital of East Tennessee uh, with all the tourists that we have here and as much interest as there is on these two statues that we have done. I mean, we get contacted all the time by people who have come to Knoxville specifically to see those statues. I'm sure they would go to the museum as well. So how would someone contact the Suffrage Coalition? We have our website, suffragecoalition.org, and then we have a Facebook page, Suffrage Coalition. And so like us on Facebook, visit our website, and join our group. Wanda, thank you so much for your time, and also thank you for preserving the fascinating history of women's suffrage, especially here in Tennessee. Well, thank you for having me.